please like our video and subscribe to Rotowire. Then go to rotowire.com slash pod for a free 10-day trial. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast, the Sunday night version. I am Scott Jensen. Joined, as always, on Sunday evenings by Jeff Erickson. If you could please rate or view the podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. It goes a long way towards helping people find the podcast. It uh, helps us out a lot. So if you enjoy listening to us, you can leave us a bunch of stars and a nice comment. We would uh, we'd be very, uh, very thankful for that. Uh, Jeff, I feel like today is the day that we really jump into baseball season fully. The Super Bowl's over. Terrible game. Um, kind of boring. Whole second half. Halftime show was kind of eh. Um, I know you liked it on Twitter, but um, I feel like today is the day that I really start thinking fully about baseball. You know, football's gone. I kind of This is kind of the point where I jump full, full into baseball. Yeah, it's always the traditional demarcation. We'll probably see a surge of signups tomorrow. Uh, we'll see, you know, I, I've got mega podcast i tweeted about that and you you felt a little lonely and all I would, that no, i i more felt like you know our sunday night time was used to be special now you do a, a podcast every day you're important it's just i don't know just i feel like uh, you know it's not important i thought you meant like from the standpoint that you weren't doing all these extra podcasts oh god no i hope nobody took it that way oh that's terrible no yeah. i meant uh, i meant that you know i felt like our special time was not so special anymore oh it's still special scott <laughs> i mean i do video on this one for crying there out you loud. go that that's how, how special it is how is everything how is everything over there with you you know, good, good, good. Uh, times are flying. Uh, just and hey, it's, we're talking baseball. You know, it, after all this talk about you know the slow off season, it was super slow, but most of the major dominoes have fallen. Now it's just the secondary pieces yeah. left to go. Like the best free agent is what Trevor Rosenthal, Justin Turner, Jackie Bradley Jr. Yeah, um, you know, we we can make most of our our, our plans, uh, at least our draft plans. There's not too many ones where like ah. Oh, I really, you know, it's the San Diego Padres, Padres closer job is ba- basically yeah. the last domino to fall. And, that, and that's a big spot. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of, uh, you know, A's DH now is, uh, is, is wide open. So that's, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, we live in L.A. Obviously, the big news this week. I know they covered it on the on the Friday podcast, but I just want to hit up your thoughts on, on Trevor Bauer coming to L.A. Uh, a massive deal that is weirdly structured that it could be a one year or two year or a three year deal. I kind of look at it like a two year deal. I don't think he'll take that last third year of it, but. The 85 million for the first two years, or 82 million, whatever it is, is, is pretty massive. Um, obviously, it's a huge thing for him coming to LA. Um, you know, great, a good place to pitch, a great offense, good defense. It's a really good spot for his fantasy value. I think we're going to see him move up into the into the late first round. He was kind of already there, but maybe maybe like pick 11, 12, 13 now. Um, but I think that the big thing with fantasy wise, you know, there's only so much we can talk about Bauer, but like the re- what it does is the rest of the Dodgers rotation. I mean, you got Tony Gonsolin, you've got uh, you got Urias, you got uh, Trevor, you got Trevor May, Dustin. Trevor May, Dustin May, Dustin, Dustin May. May, Trevor May's on the Twins. Um, you got uh, you got Dustin May, who uh, you know we we like and has good stuff and doesn't strike guys out. But how do you think they deal with this rotation? I think we just see a lot of uh, a lot of skip starts here and there. Do you think they move Gonsolin and May to the bullpen? Where, how are you, how are you feeling about the Dodgers rotation? You know, it's funny because I have May in both of my DCs, and I'm instantly regretful of that. Even though I could have seen this coming. I mean, how many teams really realistically had a chance at Bauer? So that, that's shame on kinda, me just a little bit. It sounds like two, really, by the end. It was like it was pretty much Metro Dodgers like the last couple of weeks. Right. Which, I'm frankly, I'm surprised the Yankees never made a play at it. But once they started signing uh, like the all the other, uh, let's take a chance on Kluber. Let's take right. a chance. Let's trade for Tyon. Okay, that's not happening now. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I still think May probably gets 15 to 20 starts. Somehow, I mean, I, I think they are going to mix and match and protect. Uh, I think they'll go. But, you know, Bauer, they're just going to let him pitch. I mean, he's going to get his innings. I'm not really I worried mean, about him at all. And that's the thing. With, I mean, you've got four guys there now that probably get their innings, right? I mean, I, I if, assuming David Price comes back and is fine, you got to think between him, Bueller, they'll probably you know ease off Bueller maybe a little bit. But him, Price, Kershaw, Bueller, Bauer, like, I mean, unless those guys are hurt, those guys are pitching regular. You're not skipping those guys. You're not, uh, you know— pushing those guys back at all. I mean, those guys, you that's might skip guys I mean, yeah, Kershaw might, missed but... opening day last year with the back. He missed a playoff start. Uh, Bueller wasn't yeah. ready for the start of the season yeah. last year. That was all injury related though. I mean, what? I, but Kershaw always misses, you know, a few weeks anyway. So exactly. That, that's, but that's kind of my point. Yeah. Uh, Price was banged up a little bit in, in his last, in his last couple of years with Boston. Uh, and, and a full year off. Like who knows what we're really getting. Yeah. Urias, you know, still is young. That's the thing. How old is Julio Urias? Don't look. Uh, 24. You are correct, sir. You oh, knew this already. That. No, I was going to say 23, and then I bumped it up a year. You're good at your job. I like that. That's uh, 
it's crazy. It seems it, he started so young that he feels like he's been around for so long. And like we've been talking about when is the when is the Urias breakout coming? But I think what it comes down to is like what a good problem to have to have seven starters there be likes. Like, yeah, and that's by design. Have, that is most teams have two and right. they have seven. And this has been their, but that's been their mo the last like five six years. The, the, the built-in redundancy is such a such a smart play by them, and of course they have the budget to afford it, the wherewithal to, to fit it in. Uh, money, yeah, but money, you know, money plus plus a smart front office is a pretty powerful combo. Yeah, we always wondered what 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 would Friedman or uh, Billy Bean do with the budget? Yeah. Well, here you go. This is what they do, uh, and it, of course I I think this is smart. It's I think it's kind of funny the two NL Cy Young candidates Bauer and Darvish both got traded out of the Central. Or yep. not traded. Well, one got traded, one left the central voluntarily. But yep. they landed in great spots, so yep. they won't feel the full regression effect. Like, say, if Bauer signed with the Mets, I might have been a little less sanguine on his prospects uh, I, because of the fact that it's a tougher division, tougher, you know. And because the, the West, he still has to face the Padres, but you know, obviously, he's not facing his own team. Uh, yeah. He'll fa- he'll go to Coors Field, but against the worst Rockies lineup I think they've ever had. Yeah. Uh, maybe expansion Rockies was worse, but the Giants might actually have a good lineup uh, in, in a ballpark that's not quite as punitive for hitters as it has been in the past. But Arizona might have a worse lineup, so yeah. it kind of is a trade off there. And I mean, it's Trevor Bauer. You're starting him in in San Francisco without a doubt. I mean, it's just there's there's very few spots he's in. I mean, it's interesting. I looked at World Series odds. After he signed, two of the top three teams in the World Series are in the same division, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, Dodgers, Bauer had Dodgers that. Dodgers one, Yankees two, Padres three. Yeah. And you saw that start that Bauer had against the Braves in Atlanta in a great ballpark. And, yeah. you know, Grant, one start, you know, but still, it was an incredible start. Yeah. You know, he backed up everything he said he'd do last year, which is is pretty impressive. So you obviously are a Reds fan. Uh, you watch Bauer every start last year. How do you feel about him? Because, like, it's funny. You get the oh, he signed for all this money, and then you get the, all the people like, oh, he's had a good year and a half. Like, where do you fall on him just as a pitcher going to L.A. right now? I, I kind of feel like he's had one bad year. I'm more like on that. Yes, we've talked about his whip issues even pre-2018. But that was 2019 was really the only disaster. Uh, it's just whip is still going to be an issue. And it, it, as always, as, you know, and I always invoke Scott Pianowski, but regress to what is the question? He he's not going to have a 0.79 whip. I think we know that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but is it 109? 105? Could be. I could see that. Um uh, I don't think it's going to be 130. I, I think that those days are done. Uh but yeah, and, and that's like 32 ERA and 1 1 whip. I mean, that's a and a ton of strikeouts, a ton of innings, and a lot of wins in L.A. I mean, that's a really, really right. good line. And that's a big regression off last year and still an incredible line. Right. And all along, we've been talking about his, you know, using six, whatever sticky substance he's using that hitters want them to use so they don't get beaned, you know. Yeah. And, you know, they, unless MLB does this wholesale enforcement of this, you're, you're just going to see this continue to happen. Uh, you know, it won't be – it can't just single him out. I don't think they can at least. Uh, but, you know, you look at his walk percentage and it, it, it dropped, you know, it, well, actually, yeah, it, it dropped to 6.4% last year. I mean, that that's really good, especially when you have a 35% strikeout rate. These are things you want are interested in for sure. Yeah. I mean, the numbers were absurd, but they weren't, they weren't lucky in any way. He was all, he was just really, really good the whole year. How far do you drop um, someone like Gonsolin or May down? Like, are you still, I mean, they weren't. They were kind of moving up a little bit just because they're Dodgers and people think they're good and people like them. Um, how far do you think that something like this drops them down? Uh, and I have to do this, actually. This is this is one of the things I need to do in the next day or two. I've been kind of nice. denying reality because I have me on my, both my squads. But I had them for 26 starts. I got to cut that probably by 10 and you know cut, cut the innings almost in half. Yeah, because I think his starts will be shorter, too, when he does start, because he isn't going to be starting on a regular basis. So probably won't be able to build up that endurance to go deeper into games. Same with Gonsolin. I mean, they, they could just pair off each other at times, or they could both be in long relief, pair, you know, backing up Urias. I think Price is a big wild card here. I think we don't know what he's going to be able to do after a full season off. You know, and yeah. I, he says he he's, he plans on returning, but... And he could return in that first month and a half is like four or five innings starts, or maybe he's super rested and he's like good to go. I just don't think we'll we know. But right. Gay, or if he'll uh, be good for that matter. Yeah. 
May's ADP is 165 right now in the last three weeks. I got to think that drops down to past 200, I think. Yeah, I, I was in on that too, by the way. Uh, that was, you know, I, 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 I was one of the drivers of that. You know, let's see, that, that transaction happened on the 5th. Let's see if there, you know, over the weekend, what sort of, uh, if there was any sort yeah. of draft. Sometimes those draft champions that you know started before that will will mess that up a little bit, but yeah, you right. could probably see if there's any movement at all. Right. Um. Yeah. That that's actually a really good point. One uh, two oh one. Uh. But there that's only go. three drafts. Yeah, but that still says something. I mean, it, it says that he's. I mean, he's he's definitely dropping. I think that. I think you're probably talking the the early two hundreds probably right now. And then Who, Gonsolin was what like Gonsolin was around two hundred, and he probably goes like two fifty. He's two oh seven in these three drafts. So. I, I was just going to ask you, May or Gonsolin? Who do you like better? You know, May. I just think the stuff is yeah, the upside too. stuff is there. I mean, I know he hasn't sorted the guys out. I just kind of think he'll figure it out. I think it's a pitch mix thing, um, but it's you know, it's kind of always been the same. But I just like the stuff I watch him. I think I just uh, I think a little more upside there. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, I, I I'd agree with this. Uh, and I think Gonsolin's solid. I just I mean they got seven guys that like it's just it's it's an embarrassment of riches. It is. It really is. So. so- yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely downgrading both of them, and I'll, but the thing is, like, you need to find good pitchers, period. Mm-hmm. And but if, I, you're, and if I, you're at pick one, you know, even if it's pick like 190, that's what the you know 13th round. It's hard to take a guy that's like your SP four, SP five. It's hard to take a guy that you know you might not use for the first six. I months. was just gonna say, I'll take the chance more likely on a 12 than I will the 15, Me too, because sure. it's so hard to find the guys yeah. that you know. That SB4, SB5 that you can leave in every week, almost every week. You, you kind of have to at SB4 or 5. Like, you don't want right. a guy that you're, you're not being able to start, especially the first. Even if it's like, even if he gets six weeks and finally starts, it's hard to it's hard to have a guy like that maybe use twice in the first month and a half. That's, that's really rough. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. So, uh, you know, in, in a DC, maybe I'd be more inclined to just keep rolling with him there. Yeah. But in, in the main, if we or any sort, I, of course, we're not going to be pushed for that decision for another six plus weeks. So, right. Uh, Ooh, but six yeah. plus weeks, that, that sounds like it's coming quick too. It is it, yeah. before so quicker life, than you realize life comes at you fast as we've learned way too many times and way too many bad ways. Uh, just a quick heads up, you know, an RIP to uh, Pedro Gomez as yes, the latest yeah. example of that. Horrible. Horrible. Uh, that, that one shook me 58. And it seemed like, I mean, somebody that everybody seemed to really like, you saw this stuff on Twitter. I mean, everybody ESPN liked him. I mean, not ESPN liked him. It was like, it was just a, a lot of support of people that really, really liked the guy. And it came out of the blue. He tweeted yeah. earlier today. I mean, wow. just I had a, ugh, brutal. Yeah, horrible, horrible news. Um, so uh, and back to baseball. It was a, there was a big trade. I guess a fairly big trade on what was that Saturday? Yeah, Saturday morning. Uh, the A's traded uh, Chris Davis to Texas for Elvis Andrus. Uh, the A's needed a shortstop. They got one. Um, they got one that you know was kind of just okay offensively, maybe even a little bit less than that, but you know pretty good defensively. We'll play every day. It's funny, fan. He's one of those guys that's better fantasy wise than he is real baseball, just because of the stolen bases. But I mean, you look at 2019. He had uh, 12 home runs, 31 steals, hit 275. He always has a really good contact rate, but you know, you're just not going to get a lot of pop. I think the bigger thing, Anderson, at least looking at fantasy, is is whether he's going to steal or not. Because he did not steal in 2018. He had five stolen bases. Then he stole in 2019. He had 31. And last year, just uh, it was kind of a, it was just an awful year for him. He hit, hit a hit a buck 94, and he got hurt, and he got only played 29 games. Um, what do you think about Andrus in terms of just fantasy baseball? He's going to play every day. I have to think he hits uh, bottom half of the lineup, though. Yeah, I, I bumped him up on his playing time projection. He may, maybe he doesn't hold on to the job all year, but because this is his last year of his contract too. Uh, uh, that got, big eight-year you know, deal that he's he got signed. Three years left. What's that? He has three years left. Did I read that wrong? I thought yeah, he signed in, no, in 20- April 2013 an eight-year deal. He uh, it has it has it, according to the, all the contract stuff and according to all the A's beat writers, he has three years left. The last year is a is a, a player option though. It, it transformed huh. from club option to player option. Okay, I I, I need to double check my facts I and maybe update the site. I think the extension he signed, he wasn't uh, it kicked in a couple years later. I don't think he was. I think it was like he still was on his current contract. that kicked in after that. Okay, okay, I'll I believe you. Uh, just I I I just read wrong information. So uh, yeah, that's always fun. Uh, but. Yeah, okay. Uh, that makes it worse. <laughs> I it, thought this it, was just a year. To, yeah, you're right. 2000 is through. You know, I guess the contract, he signed it, but it didn't kick in until 2015. Yep. Yeah, so it goes through 23. And then the wild thing about the, the kicker is when the trade, there's a trade kicker that it goes from a club option to a player option, that 2023. So it becomes his choice. And 
Um, I don't think Elvis Anders is getting fifteen million dollars a year in twenty twenty three. So either going to have to trade him or do something to him. But he's there's no way he's turning that fifteen million. Of down, course right? not. Yeah. yeah, of course not. The A's are trying uh, yeah. to save money this year. They save $11.5 million with the deal this year with the difference between the two salaries plus the Rangers kicked in $13.5 million. So they saved a bunch of money this year, and I figure they're probably going to either dump them or figure out to do with it next year. But the A's are so in, like, save money this year mode that it's just kind of gross overall. But I want to talk about Chris Davis, though. I think Anders is kind of who he is. But Chris Davis is fascinating. Chris Davis hit in 2016, 2017, 2018, 42, 43, and 48 home runs. Uh, hard hit rate those three uh, those three years was really high. But if you look at the last three years, 2018, 2019, 2020, hard hit rate 47.5%, 39%, 30% last year. His barrel rate was over 16% in all three of those big home run years I mentioned, under 9% the last two years. Mm-hmm. We talked about in 2019, he had the injury. He ran into the wall at PNC and was never the same and should never play defense ever again, of course. Um, but he's been a completely different hitter the last two years. And I, you look at his his his. Uh, batting average against breaking balls last year was 033. He had one hit against breaking balls last year. It was a home run, but it was one hit. Um, I just think people figured out how to pitch to him, and he cannot hit breaking balls, and they've done that the last two years. He was 195 on them in 2019. I just wonder if maybe the scouting report finally caught up, and they know what he can't do, but he's been a completely different player the last two years, and I, I, I watched them a lot, and he's looked lost, and I can't fully figure out what happened. I think opposing teams finally watched Trouble with the Curve and figured out yeah, that— right? Yeah, because it's this big mystery that only a grizzled scout could figure out that you sh- struggle with curveballs. He's, you know, scout by the numbers. People can't read fan graphs or baseball savant and see trouble with the curveball. No. Uh, I, yeah. I, my thesis last year was that playing defense wrecked him and that he'd be fine when he tr- returns fully healthy. I, I think that's a failed thesis. I, I, and it's weird. Like his strike, he's not striking out more, he's just not hitting the ball hard at all compared to what he used to do. And it's, it's a huge drop off and it's pretty significant year over year. And it's, uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to get excited about him. I, if he was in the old Texas where he mashed all the time, maybe, but out of this new park, not really a hitter's park. No, nope. he's just, uh, I, it's hard for me to get behind. I mean, you got to figure at least to start out, he'll play every day, but um, I don't know. I'm not in on Davis right now. He doesn't get to hit against strangers pitchers. Does he? <laughs> That'd be nice if he did. Yeah. I mean, Kyle Gibson's over there. Here, let me throw you a batting practice. Oh, wait, that's a game pitch. Oh, wait, I can't tell the difference anymore. Oh, no. Uh, but hey, it sounds like Mike Fires. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting to that one there. Do we have but, to? All right, all right, all right, oh, you said major deals that we're covering. So, yeah, but, right. Um, no, I, you I know, know I saw a speculation that maybe they just de- uh, designate him for assignment uh, upon the deal because they need the 40 man roster spot. Um, so, that's still possible. But I don't know. Uh, you know, the fact that the A's had to include Heim is to me is the indicator, though, that this was like, you know, Davis is kind of, you know, he's a lottery ticket at this point for the Rangers. There's no defensive value whatsoever. So in real life, I mean, it's, you know, they, they've got a right handed Joey, you know, no, they got, I was going to say they have a right handed Joey Gallo, but Gallo can actually play defense. Yeah, Gallo can't hit 247 either, though. Um, do you think Davis plays every day you've got leota Tavares in center you got david Dahl. you got joey gallo in the outfield you have willie calhoun and we're gonna talk about later one of the guys i want to talk about i mean that's four spots right there do you think davis plays over any of those guys regularly no i don't i think he's i, I, I said he's gonna play every day earlier and i kind of looked at the lineup and i don't it's not quite as thin as i thought it was when when i when i saw the deal i mean he you know he i've heard possibilities of like May, uh, I, I that maybe someone like uh, you know Calhoun could play a little first base, but he's also lefty and so is Nate Lowe. So how does that work out? I, I, I mean, I, I just don't see it. I mean, I, I think he's like the platoon guy. I think he's a lefty masher, and maybe he gets to hit against some righties here and there. But see, see also trouble with curve, and you know I, I don't see too many opportunities. I mean, I, I do. I don't think he plays every day. No. I, uh, I like Justin Timberlake. I like Amy Adams. I like baseball movies. That is not a good movie. Yeah, I even like a lot of Clint Eastwood movies. I do too. I, uh, that is, it's, it's well, it, it pitched itself as the anti-money ball, and of course a lot of people rallied behind that. And It's the human side of baseball and all that. And yeah, I get it. I get that the, the money, you know, there might be a little too far in some p- people's minds about analytics. The analytics that... Uh, you know, that that's the first way you under, you know, knowing that the person that's speaking doesn't understand what they're talking about is when they call it the analytics, but, uh, as, you know, that's fine. You know, I love the, I love the basketball announcers that every time someone shoots a three, it's because of analytics. It's like, come on. Or when someone goes for it on fourth down in football. Yep. Yep. Every time. 
Uh, so let's jump out to some other uh, other major deals here. Marcel Ozuna was kind of the big uh, major deal at uh, with the last big one of the last big hitters. Um, huge 2020. We talked about liking him last year uh, pre-draft just because the the 2019 was down numbers wise, but all the all the indicators were that he was still really good. Just kind of maybe had had a bad luck season. Um, great spot, good lineup. Not much to talk about Ozuna. He's really good. ADP 49. Do you think that goes uh, up or down with the with the signing with the Braves? Up, absolutely up. I mean, it's a great ballpark to hit in. One of the best in baseball. Uh, third yeah, highest elevation lineups. in baseball, yeah. I think. Good lineup spot. It's just, uh, it's a really good spot. I don't, I don't know how much it can move up. There's a lot of good players right in front of them. Would you take him right at the, the three, four turn there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it depends on my build. And, you know, yeah. obviously, if I, I've started off with one or you know a power guy that doesn't have any speed, then I'm less inclined to do so. Right. But we know this is this is a perfect fit for him. Uh, you know, it's, I, I think, yeah. And, you know, I'm going to be looking to see if I have two pitchers at this point or how many pitchers I have and all that. We're talking 15s and at 12, I freely take them. He, the, the 12 stolen bases in 2019 are weird, by the way, they stick out of that like line. So strangely, he has like 15 stolen bases the rest of his career. Yeah. Every once in a while you get an outlier <laughs> yeah. like that. And I, it's weird. Sometimes you get in that season where guys, a guy's struggling and he's just trying to do anything to like contribute. He's, he can't, he's not, he's struggling hitting wise. He wants to do something else. Bryce Harper had a year like that where his average is way down, but he stole a bunch of bases. It was just interesting. It came and it is really down average. He hit 240 that year. Yeah. It reminds me, there's, I, I forget the player, but super slow guy had like eight or nine triples in one year. Um, just cause he pounded the ball into the corners recently, recently, like ben, Benji Molina, not that, no more recent than that, <laughs> not but that slow. And not, and not quite that slow, but sort of that sort of like, no, there's no way that should be. And I'll I'll remember it like tomorrow. It'll be awesome. Great stuff. Someone's probably, someone's probably tweeting at you right now as I listen. It's like getting into an argument and then like thinking of the perfect rebuttal later on after the fact. It's great. The jerk store called? Is that what it was? Something like that. Um, Jonathan VR, uh, you talked to me as a Reds fan. I don't know what's going on with him. He's like signed but didn't sign. There was stuff on Twitter. Now, now they're just talking. Um, a, what's going on with the situation? B, how do you feel about it as a Reds fan? And C, how do you feel about it fantasy wise? How does it affect his value? He's not signed yet. That's the first okay. thing. Um, is it like one of those things that's kind of done? And I don't think so. Okay. I, I in fact, the, the, you know, they they kind of said they haven't agreed on terms yet. I think was the actual statement. So I, it's I don't even think it's like a case of med, uh, medicals. And even Bobby Nightingale's article in Cincinnati Inquirer suggested that. They may even ask him on a minor league deal, which show, kind of shows what his value has dropped to. But he can uh, he he can hang out with D Gordon. Well, they signed him today, and I think that's actually kind of a sign that they may not think they may think they may not have a deal here. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, you know, you trade Rizal Iglesias, you let you know Bauer, you're never going to resign. Fine, yeah. I, I get that, but they weren't. They, I don't even think they even tried. Uh, they they let Archie Bradley walk for a. Comp- you know, he had a completely reasonable option on his contract, and they're trying to reset the, the, the reliever market. They they have not signed a major league free agent. I, what 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 were they saving for? What's this? You know, the the whole point was okay. We made these moves so we could have some flexibility with what we're going to do this offseason. What 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 the heck have you done? You've done nothing. Uh, and I'm, you know, good English, Jeff. But th- there's. It, it, it's really a, a really thin facade that here, and it's aggravating. I mean, you let Kurt Caselli walk, fine. I get it. That's fine. Yeah. You have Tyler Stevens and he needs to play anyhow. But Jose Garcia is not ready for the majors. They traded for a Rule 5 guy. They have Kyle Farmer. And now you have D. Strange Gordon, who really shouldn't play shortstop, but he can, theoretically. It's not like, you know, when they went cheap and signed Jose Iglesias late, at least, at least you knew that Iglesias could play the position. Yep. You know, I'm not convinced VR can play the position. I'm not convinced D. Strange Gordon can play the, the position. And, yeah. you know, Garcia's just not can't hit big league pitching. It's it's a nightmare. Yeah. You can't you can't throw D out there at shortstop every day. I just don't I don't think that works anymore. No, um, nothing against him. Uh, you no, know, nothing I, against him. Just it's you- just a horrible off season for the Reds after such hope last off season. Like, yay, we're trying Way to go. This is the first time in a long time. Oh, that's it. Two playoff games. And we're going to give up. 
before before the Arenado move, I thought the NL Central was just like in some weird little collusion bundle where they decided right. not to sign anybody, and they were just going to kind of go on their own and, and break off and have their own little league. Yeah, well, you know, the Cardinal the Cardinals signed uh, Wainwright uh, back. Ooh, big signing, but okay, fine. Then the the Cubs signed P- Jack Peterson. That like that signing was more than the rest of the division combined for a while. It was. It was crazy. Yeah, but and uh, then and then Arenado, so that kind of broke that up, but. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Do you do you like VR? If VR were to sign, play every day for the Reds, he you know he's probably hits uh, he probably hits first. I would assume at least to start. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. Uh, how <laughs> Sorry, do you feel was that him? is that noticeable? Oh. He's he's a strange guy though. Like he had he had the huge 2019, but this is not the first time he's had a monster year and then kind of backed up. He had the 62 it was a 62 stolen base year in 2016. It was like a first late first round pick that year. And then fell off. And last year he hit 232. He did have the 16 stolen bases in 52 games. So, I mean, fantasy wise, that's a pretty big number. But only two home runs. I think counting on him for the home runs is a problem. You don't want to do that. The, the 24 is kind of out of nowhere that year at the Orioles was um, just something not going to happen. He isn't in a fly ball. He isn't the ball hard enough for that. Um, but how do you feel about fantasy wise? ADP is 149 right now. If he signs with the Reds, do you think that's about right? Would you touch him there? What do you feel about, uh, about that price? If he signs with the Reds, chances are he wins the job for half a year, uh, yeah. maybe more. And yeah, I, some power comes back without a doubt. Um, it, it, this is a fantasy podcast first, so it helps his value if he signs with the Reds without yeah. a doubt. It's hard yeah. to find speed guys. It's hard to you know playing in a good ballpark. We'll see about the leadoff thing. I mean, he's never had a walk rate. He's at once had a walk percentage over ten percent. He's not an on base guy. If if he hits two sixty, then he's a credible on base guy. He's, you know, he had one year in Milwaukee where he actually had anything over 350. That's that's not a good on base guy. Yeah, um, he's not. That means he's not a good leadoff guy. Uh, but I mean, you know, the Reds have this w- weird thing where the only guys that get on base are super slow. And it's Winker and Votto, and yeah. then they have sluggers behind that that don't get on base. It's a, it's a really weirdly constru- uh, constructed lineup. Um, I don't know how they get around that, by the way. Uh, it just. But, you know, the fact that they signed Gordon just to me is is like a hint that they may not come to this deal with VR. Yeah. And so we have, it's it's I, I'm old enough to remember Thursday night when a national reporter got something wrong on a free agent. So uh, we'll see. Oh, that poor national reporter. He's not had a good week. Um, yeah, it's interesting because VR is not super fast either. He's like a, a little bit faster than average sprint speed guy, but just a good base dealer. Like yeah, he, just, he, he has good. He has a good percentage. He was he was 40, 40 steals and only nine caught in twenty nineteen. He was sixteen and five last year. So he's like he just he's just one of those guys that knows how to steal bases, read pitchers because he's not he's a fifty seven percentile sprint speed guy. And I went back and looked, and he's kind of a, been a little bit faster a couple years prior, but he's never like a, a high end uh, sprint speed guy. No, he just gets good jumps, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that, that matters. which, which is valuable we didn't still like get, guys they're super fast and they get bad jumps so yeah. i mean it, it works both ways i mean even last year's trash heap of a season he got 16 stolen bases yeah <laughs> I mean, that's... yeah from a fantasy standpoint that, that pays our bills i mean it, it, we might hold the nose and taking him but i don't think he i don't think he's going to go to full to shields on us so i think we're okay yeah and that's 52 games i mean that's a third of a season you're not going to just triple that number but even right. if you double and a half that number and you get to like 38 like that's massive. Dude. There's not a lot of guys who are stealing 38 bases in the majors anymore. Yeah. I, m- yeah. Right now my projection has him pretty low, but I also cut down his playing time. Cause I didn't think he's going to land on a team that gave him full time, a full time yeah. gig. But if he signs with the reds, I'm going to put, put him back up to probably like 145 games, which is probably gets him so close too. to his ADP and maybe even higher. And the thing is, again, lineup construction draft, it, you know, if you've got Mondesi on your team, if you've got a uh, couple, you've got Starling Marte and another yep. guy that runs, well, I'll let, I'll let somebody else kick that can. But if you're in the even the eighth or ninth round and you're suddenly low on steals, you could see that get pushed up a little bit. I, I think oh, that, he'll get pushed up for sure if he yeah, signs with the I Reds. I think so, too. I just, there's, there's too many possible stolen bases there that somebody's not going to need that in the late eighth round or something like that. Right. Just don't, you know, don't get yourself where you, in a position where you have to have them. Get agreed, to a agreed. position where it helps you, but, you know, that, that, I think that's always critical. So let's jump into some guys. Uh, last week we talked about guys in the kind of the 200, 300 range. They're interesting names. Let's jump after 300. This is not necessarily targets or fades quite yet. We will do that podcast in March. But um, I just like names of interest. Guys that as I'm scrolling through and I see them post 300, I think are interesting names. And guys that like, you know, I don't expect them to be in the in the 20s or they're interesting to me. Uh, let's stick with the Reds first of all, since we're talking about the Reds. Uh, Reds closers. Uh, Amir Garrett ADP is about 305. 
Lucas Sims is 360. I'm going to kick it to you since we're talking Reds here. Um, a, do you think, who do you, th- do you think they set on a closer? Who do you think it'll be? And, and who do you like between these two guys? I think they'll profess that it's going to be a timeshare. And as soon as someone nails down three in a row, that's that's what will happen, okay. I think. But, you know, the thing that bothers me a little bit with Amir Garrett, who I think is probably the, considered to be the favorite, is Bell's usage of him. Doesn't let him go too too deep into games. You look at his game log. You know, a lot of, you know, one inning, two-thirds of an inning, third of an inning. You know, they, he doesn't let him, you know, go deep. And I, I don't think that's good for a putative closer. I think that means that he tries to mix and match lefty-righty a little bit. And they only have one other lefty in the bullpen, and that's Sean Doolittle, who you and I both like. But, yep. you know, I don't like the 2020 version of Sean Doolittle. I like him as a human being, but not yeah. so much as a pitcher. But I, I need to see him throw some healthy innings before I'm yeah. – I'm healthy fully, velocity. I'm fully secure that he's back. Yeah, the velocity is key with him. I mean, he throws so many fastballs. If it's a, even two ticks off, that's a, that's a pretty major thing because he relies so much on that heater. And he dropped three miles an hour last year. That's He's just not the same guy. I mean, when he, when he was with the A's and really good, he was gassing people and just throwing. He would throw a, a slider to every once in a while just to keep guys honest. But I mean, it right. was you knew it was coming. You could, still couldn't hit it. Right, right. And, you know, the pro, it started sliding back half of 2019. You know, that, that was when some of the problems started ha- happening, even if the velocity didn't demonstrate that. Uh, but at his peak in Oakland, it was at 94.8, 94.7 as his average fastball. You know, and he that, would he would gas it up even higher in, in big spots, too. Like yeah, when he needed 96. it. Yep. Yeah, he would needed it. Do you think signing Doolittle helps Garrett in terms of you get another lefty there that maybe it pushes him to the ninth where they don't maybe sure. need him in the seventh against a lefty? I think that from like a, str- a strategy way of them using him, I thought that was a good sign for Garrett. That's the intent. Um, we'll see if they can follow through. The, again, he's got to be able to do something first before I buy into it there. But uh, how, much the, Sim, how much of the walks scare you with Garrett? A little bit. Uh, That's and, kind of my major thing as a closer with him is 14% walk rate in 2019, down to 10% last year. So he got a little better. Um, the strikeout rate was massive last year. It was like 38% last year. He was really good last year. The funny thing about Garrett is, you know, bef- oh, wait, I was, I'm looking at the wrong person's saddle. I was looking at Doolittle. I was like, yeah, he dropped. Doolittle yeah. went from 5.8 to 11.1. Which, he did. By the that, way. It, it, he never walked guys forever, and then that changed. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, the thing about the thing is, too, you never like watching a closer nib, nibble. You know, if, you st- me, if he's walking crazy. guys, it's just painful. Yeah, 10.6 last year, and that, that marks a good improvement. That's, that's still a pretty high rate. Not happy about that. But then again, you get you strike out 38% of the batters you face. I kind of like – I do like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it was eighteen percent swing strike rate last year. I mean, he was he was really. I mean, it was only eighteen innings, but he was really good last year. Yeah, he only he faced so few batters last year. That's he gave wild. up. He gave up. He gave one hit to lefties last year all year. Yeah, yeah, only it's faced twenty six of them though. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's the thing is like immediately he'd come in and they they take out any le- you know take out the lefties too. So right. yeah, it, it's going to be see interesting to see how that goes. Now, meanwhile, on the converse side, Sims is a multi inning guy. That that's a positive and a negative. I mean, it means that you know you don't have to take him out when you've got a lefty coming up, but it also means like, well, we may want to use him here in the seventh inning. This is our key spot. Yep. I think that's the type. Of, I think that's the manager Bell wants to be. I think he kind of melds back into being a traditional closer in the ninth inning when pushed. Mm-hmm. But I think ideally he would like to have a ace reliever concept there. And yeah, have, they were they were pretty traditional last year with Iglesias, right? Pretty, yeah, pretty. And oh, so part of that was because Iglesias pushed back. Question. Yeah. So oh, that's right. I remember he did that. He did. Remember the year before he got mad, right? He got upset when they wouldn't use him as a closer. That's right. Yeah. Uh, dark horse here, Jose De Leon. He might, he might start oh. someday. Uh, Last, fast. They love what he did in the off season. They, they were impressed with uh, a lot of the things he did at the alternate training site last year. Of course, he got rocked in his one outing with the Reds, but or uh, five outings with the Reds, but six innings, I guess it was. But they they, they were really they really think he can be a contributor. Uh, had a big winter season. Uh, you know, Kyle Body was talking him up, and you know that that's always you that's someone you want talking him up. Uh, they, they said he's kind of this year's uh, version of uh, Tyler Malley, the guy that can take the leap. All right. If you had to pick right now and a season, you're open up the almanac. Who has the most saves on the Reds? I'm gonna say Sims. I'm gonna say Sims too. I like uh, I like the six uh, sixty picks later. I'll take Sims over Garrett. Yeah, 
And I've seen other drafts where he's gone like within a round of each other. So yeah. it's just, you kind of have to have a good feel for it. Here's the thing. You can probably get both if you're, yeah. and that's maybe not such a bad play. Uh, you know, the whole, the, the, I'm really struggling to find closer two on my team. So why not just take a committee of a team that's going to be decent? Yeah, I don't love getting two guys, but if it's this late, I don't mind it because it's right. both after the, it's in the, you know, when, even if you bump one up to the 18th, you're talking past the 18th round, I'm fine to do it too. Like, I don't like getting one of those guys early that doesn't really close. You have to get a guy later. But if you get two guys late and you kind of lock in one spot, it might be frustrating for a few weeks while they figure it out. But at some point, you'll probably have a pretty good feel of which guy you want to use more. Yeah. The intersection of skills, cost, number of competitors, I, you know, I think. You compare that like the, the like if you want to go get Padres saves, you're gonna to have to pay a little bit more of a price, you know. Yep. And I have done so with Pomeranz, but but you're not locked in. With, you know, he's not locked in in the job. Uh, the A's, we don't really know who's locked in the job. Deekman is like publicly anointed as the guy who might get the first shot, but no one really I wants think, to believe that they'll they'll manage him like that. I think they're gonna sign somebody. I think yeah, there's still guy. That's the thing. Relievers are still out there. Yeah, I think they're um, going to sign a righty that maybe uh, probably looks that uh, at least a split with Deakman. Yeah, I, I could see that happening. Um, the Cardinals, there's you know there's there's a presumptive favorite in Hicks, but there's the the threat of managing him, and we don't know what he's going to be like coming back from an injury. Uh, and there might be like four guys there. That's the problem. So this is you know you have two competitors with the Reds. That's one of the things I like about it, which means the prices will probably go up later on too. Probably so. Um, let's get down to some uh, a couple starters here. Uh, Taiwan Walker is not, has not signed yet, so that, obviously it matters a lot where he signs. Mm -hmm. But a, a super highly touted guy a few years ago, um, coming up with the with the Mariners and all that, uh, he pitched 14 total innings in 2018, 2019. So not not much to look at there. But last year he came back off the injury, 53 and a third, 3.7 ERA. Um, I don't really see a lot to get fired up here. I know a lot of people really like Taiwan Walker and they think he, he kind of a, a gem late pick. Um, as I got deep into him, uh, I didn't see it. He's not someone that I'm targeting myself. So I'm I'm okay with taking a chance on him. I mean, he was he he was be, uh, the funny thing is he had a better ERA with the Blue Jays, but a worse WHIP. Uh, like it was a four uh, even four ERA with the Mariners, but a 107 WHIP with the Blue Jays, 137, 125, respectively. Mep turns into combined 270, 116. You know, I get that. I mean, he was man. He there was a couple times where he got pulled from games like an inherited runner scored and the, uh, with the blue Jays, he got, he was getting upset because Montoyo actually has a uh, pretty quick hook. And I think that's, a, I don't think it's, it might not even be him. It might be a front office thing too for in Toronto. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of interested in him. I want to see, you know, he, it, I can't trust him staying healthy, but I think the price is right at that cost. Yeah, I think the price is right. I just think there's other guys there. I like more. Uh, my, my concerns with him, Swinging striker is only was under eight percent last year. His velocity was down to ninety three. That worries me a little bit too. Yeah. He didn't have a single pitch with over a twenty five percent whiff rate last year. This doesn't like have that go to to punch guys out. I just I think he's kind of a, a, a going to be a low like a twenty to twenty one percent strikeout rate guy. I think it matters a lot where he signs. I think if he signs maybe in a good National League spot, maybe I'd be a little more interested. But I I worry about the strikeouts. Um, without kind of that go-to punch-out pitch, whether he gets hit around a little bit, especially if he goes to maybe a tougher AL spot. Yeah, you might be right about that. And it's not like he's a massive ground ball guy either. You know, 39% last year. So yeah, you you, you might be talking me down on him a little bit. Yeah, 243 Babbitt, I think, helped him out a little bit last year. Had some homer. Again, 1.35 homers per nine. Um, I don't know. I thought I was going to like him more than I did when I looked into it. And when I got there, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm probably not taking him. Yeah. Let's, let's see where he signs. But yeah, I think you're probably yeah, right about big, that. Yeah, big where he signs. The next guy up, I think I like more. Kind of in a similar spot as Yusei Kikuchi in Seattle. Um, ugly line if you look at it. 5.17 ERA in 47 innings, but a 3.3 FIP. I think I'm a little jaded by my eye test because he pitched really well against the A's twice <laughs> in games that I watched. I admit that sometimes that happens. Um, but like the strand rate killed him. He was like a 60% there. Um, he was bad in 2019, but the things I like, I, I just like the steps up. He took last year. Velocity went from 92 and a half to 95. Um, ground ball rate jumped up to 52%. K rate went from 16% to 24%. He's one of those guys, like how much of that 2020 do we believe? Like, do we believe that's all true? Did he gas it out? Cause it was a short season, but he took enough steps up in, in different spots. And I think he's kind of an interesting guy, especially at pick 330, where you're not risking much, but I think there might be a little bit of, a little bit of hidden upside here with Kikuchi. A lot of people on him, though. Uh, yeah, he's, he's going to move up for sure. He, he's a sneaky, trendy guy. And I, I think 
you know, he goes like, I did this this first pitch Arizona speakers uh, draft champions league. When he went, like four people were like, ah, oh, you got, you know, it's uh, one of those. Yeah. Those. So, uh, you know, and I remember, I mean, everyone was talking up the increased velocity. Yep. That came with a little bit of a price, though. His walk rate jumped up to 10% last year, went from 6.9 to 10.3. Uh, I think that that's some of it there. You know, FIP loves him. You know, FIP, his FIP ERA was 329. Yeah. Uh, and a swing and a swing and miss was a lot bigger. That was the thing. It jumped yeah. from 8.8 to 12.8. So you could see tangible results there. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't allow homers. And so that's always, that's always a positive too. Uh, ground ball rate was 52%. There's a lot yeah. to like, I yeah. could see there's it. A, there's, a, there's a lot of step ups there. I, I, that's someone that as we get to like, even like 17, 18th round, I think I may, uh, I may jump up a few to, to grab him. Cause I just, I think there's enough, Enough stuff that looked really good last year that I'm willing to take a shot on. Yeah. If I recall correctly, Seattle's defense was tragic last year, and maybe we talked about the last week. The left side should be good, right? Well, yeah, With Seager's Seager pretty Crawford. solid. Crawford, Crawford, I think, too. is solid. Yeah. Okay, second base was kind of a mismatch of people. Outfield it's... was pretty. Maybe it was just the outfield defense was bad. I don't know. Maybe that's it. And you know, obviously, you're not worried about that as much as a ground ball pitcher. Yeah, I, I think it. I think they'll be all right. I mean, I don't. Dylan Moore probably move around a little bit. Uh, Evan White, who knows there at first base, but um, I don't know. I think that uh, I think there's enough there. I I I'd go Kikuchi over uh, Tywin Walker. Obviously, not knowing he's signed, but I think in a in a vacuum, in a if he goes to a, just a neutral spot where it's not extreme or the other, I think I go Kikuchi over Walker, uh, even at the lower price. Yeah, I could see it. I could see it. I think you're probably going. You know, I think you're probably going to uh, see that uh, th- those prices flip flop. Especially, I mean, right Walker's there. still on sign. I mean, that, yeah. that's a big drag on his value, too. So let's jump into some more, uh, a few more guys down here in the 300s. But first, a note from our sponsor, BetMGM. Sports bettors know that magic happens when you turn a hunch into action and apply the right amount of expertise. That's why BetMGM has teamed up with Rotowire to offer new BetMGM customers a free six-month Rotowire subscription when they place their first bet. Register on the BetMGM app or website and use promo code ROTO. That's R-O-T-O to claim your free subscription. Once you make your first sports wager, you'll receive a season's length of RotoWire's unmatched sports insights. Find out why BetMGM is the king of sportsbooks by signing up and placing your first bet today. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 522 4700 in Colorado, Nevada. 1 800 Gambler in New Jersey and West Virginia. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800 889 9789. If you or someone who has a gambling problem wants help, call 1 800 9 with it in Indiana. Promotional offer is not available in Nevada. So, Jeff, let's do another pitcher down here. A guy that is uh, buzzy on Twitter, especially last year, Matthew Boyd in, <laughs> in Detroit. Uh, there are people that love him. There's even like a Boyd Boyd's hashtag, a Boyd Boys hashtag last year that uh, I, people love Matthew Boyd. Um, he was horrible last year. 6.7 ERA, 1.48 whip in 60 innings. Um, he was buzzy last year because of the strikeout jump. He had a huge strikeout jump in 2019. Uh, he was a 30.1% strikeout rate in, in 2019. Dropped down to 22% in 2020, which is kind of in line with 2018. As you kind of look at it, that 2019 looks like kind of an outlier. His breaking pitches have really high whiff rates. It's a really good pitch, but his fastball just gets pounded. Uh, do you like him at all here, kind of the 330? It's it's way it's, it's like 10 rounds lower than it was last year. Yeah, it's funny because a couple of years ago at First Pitch Arizona, a factor fluke panel that I do, uh, this is in November always. Uh, we usually, although it was actually it was October last time we did this, but it was Robbie Ray versus Matthew Boyd. Who do you, who do you have? And I weighed in on the side of Matthew Boyd, and I think I barely won still, but it, it, winning. Um, yeah, the correct it, answer was clearly C. Yeah, it was anything else run for the hills. Uh, right. but, but there was uh, Evan Petzold. Uh, I posted this update on Roto. Evan Petzold reported from the Detroit Free Press that uh, Boyd was pitching through not one but two different injuries over the course of the season and affected his mechanics. Uh, yeah, okay, that's great. I mean, I think that so that puts him back at mid fours. Fine, it's still not a great area. You know, it's, you're getting strikeouts. You're still getting strikeouts. That's the one thing Boyd uh, does do. But 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 are you? You got strikeout once. Strikeouts once. Yeah, he got sixty. He got a strikeout per inning last year. Even in the in, yeah. amidst a disaster, that's a pretty probably, good probably, strikeout. <laughs> right. I mean, throws a lot. Of, it throws a lot of innings, right? Like you, you got that going for you, but. I know it just feels like there's a lot of buying into that one season where he really flashed a lot. Yeah, when he had a 14.2 swing swing strike rate, uh, th- yeah. that'll do that. I mean, it's still yeah. 12.9 last year, yeah, despite that's, that's the disaster. Yeah. 
And he still struck out 30, 13, a swing, had a swing and miss at 13% of his pitches. Uh, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, so I, you can squint and see something there. Uh, yeah. Walk rates below 10 home runs though. Let the Rockets red glare. That's the problem. And, Big problem. Yeah, I mean, even even in the good year, the twenty nineteen, which thirty nine homers, yeah, one point nine home runs per nine. It was, it was, he did, he does a lot of that. It's still a bad team. That's that's the other problem we're talking about here too. I mean, as much as we say don't chase wins, you got to chase wins. And you look at organizations, and but Tigers are going to lose a bunch of games. I mean, I know they had a stretch where they were credible for a while last year, but that that faded pretty quickly. And I think over the course of a long season, they get pounded into submission. Yeah, I just uh, I think there's enough there's enough concern that his fastball really just gets hit hard. I'm looking at it right here. Um, last year was uh, 322 batting average against against the fastball, 557 slug. That's uh, oh. that's not good. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. That's X slug. Slugging was actually 640, 643 against his fastball. What was it in 2019? 2019 was 535 against the fastball slugging percentage. That's still not that's good. not good. And he throws that pitch 50% of the time, too. It's not like it's something he mixes in here and there and throws a lot of cutters and sinkers. I mean, it's a pitch that he throws half the time that just gets absolutely pounded a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm out on him, too. So let's jump down to – we talked about the Rangers earlier. We're talking about Chris Davis. I want to talk to you about a couple hitters in Texas. Uh, the first is Nate Lowe. They traded from him kind of, you know, the, the free – speaking of guys that people like on Major League Baseball Twitter, Nate Lowe is someone everybody loves. They wanted him – everybody wanted him to get at bats in Tampa – he should get his chance at everyday at bats in, in Texas. Um, in 2020, he he struggled. He hit 224 when he got called up. Only 76 plate appearances, but a 37% uh, strikeout rate. 30% strikeout rate in 2019. When he got a few. He got about 100 more plate appearances than that. He had seven home runs. But you look at you look at him in the minors. I think that's where people get excited. In 2019, in AAA, he played 93 games, hit 16 home runs, had a 20% strikeout rate. You look at his K rates in the minors, kind of all in the 20% or under range. So maybe just you know not playing every day the last couple of years. Uh, they kind of they kind of jerked him around up and down, and he just you know was never really playing every day. Maybe just never got uh, comfortable. Uh, he's at uh, pick 331, so it's kind of the early 20s, right after that second break in a 15 teamer. Uh, where do you fall on Nate Lowe? Because I think he's going to move up, and I think he's going to be getting kind of buzzy as we get into March. He might. Uh, I. I... I mean, that's the strikeout rate is just so ridiculously high in the major league level. It's yeah, tough. It is. You know, it, it's kind of a lesson sometimes. Like, you see these guys in the minors that have really good walk rates. Sometimes that maybe they don't swing enough. I got to dig in a little bit more on him. Um, I, I wonder, like, you know, we were talking a little bit uh, a week ago, and I, in lots of places, I've ad infinitum, I've been talking about uh, Christian Yelich's strikeout rate. Yep. And one of the big things with him is he hasn't been uh, hasn't been swinging enough. That's been one of the problems with him. So, you know, sometimes that passivity is, is something that works against you a little bit. And I wonder if sometimes a younger player like Lowe, especially, maybe that's part of the problem. Hits the ball really hard, though. If you look at his, you take his two years combined, uh, 44.8% hard hit rate, 11.9% barrel rate, both really good numbers. Uh, it was even a little higher last year, but he only had 39 uh, batted ball events last year. But mm -hmm. um, a guy that did hit the ball in 2018, he played 130 games in the minors, hit 27 home runs. Um, you could kind of, like you, we mentioned earlier, some squinting on some guys. You could squint on him a little bit and maybe see that the 2019-2020 the are just weird up and down years. And he was good in the minors in 2019, but last year he just didn't play very much. Um, I don't know. You could see this working out with some everyday at-bats. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could. I, I, I almost – and this is where I got to be careful to – not completely appeal to authority. I need to actually dig in on the player. But you remember when the uh, Rays traded away Jake Bowers? We're like, what are they thinking? Uh -huh. You know, this is a great prospect. They just I gave him I away. Love, I love Jake Bowers. For Yandy year, Diaz. But... What are they thinking? Well, Jake Bowers point. is barely hanging on to a major league job. Tampa's I mean, I, smart. I, Tampa's smart. There's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair point. They usually don't just trade guys to trade guys. They, yeah, they don't give away young talent like that. Although, Jake Cronenworth? I mean, that yeah. kind of might have been a guy that slipped away. Or maybe they knew what they were doing and they had to trade him to get a deal done that they wanted to get done. I mean, that's the that's the counter argument. So right. I don't know. I uh, think San, San Diego's pretty smart, too. Maybe they just insisted on that in a deal and they just went ahead and did with it. But um, just sticking in Texas, I mean, we, we talked about Chris Davis. We talked about, you know, guys moving around. Willie Calhoun 
is really interesting to me. He yeah. was he was terrible last year, but he was hurt. He only had 108 plate appearances. He hit two, a buck 91, one home run. To me, he's a guy that you throw out 2020. Um, you look at 2019, he hit 269 with 21 home runs in 83 games. Like that jumps off the page right there. He's a guy that doesn't strike out a lot, which you know you gotta love that. He's a 15.7 percent K rate the last two years. He's now 26. He's a previously pretty hyped prospect when he was with the Dodgers. Uh, 40 percent, 40.7 percent hard hit rate in 2019. This is a guy that coming into 2020 we we're excited about. Then he got hurt. He kind of dropped in drafts. And they got hurt again midseason. Missed another month. Um, at pick 373, he's someone that I am very willing to take a shot. And I think that price is going to rise a little bit too. Uh, maybe a little bit playing time crunch in Texas. We talked about now they have Chris Davis, but um, he's someone that I don't think you have to squint very hard. He's some upside pretty quick with Calhoun. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. Uh, if you play NFBC, he has eight games in the outfield, so he does qualify uh, there. But check your league's nice. uh, rules requirements because if it's 10, then you get is, him DH, DH only. Is NFBC, NFBC eight or seven? Seven. Seven, okay. Yeah. I should know that, huh? Yeah, it's all right. It's all, you, you don't draft until March. We know this. I don't. I, I, still should know. I knew it was either seven or eight. I forgot what they settled on. So, But here's two, two underlying problems with him. Okay, I like to hear that. One, no position. So what that means is he gets squeezed on playing time from time to time. I mean, he, he's, not, he's a zero defensively. Maybe he's a .5. Compare him versus Chris Davis, that's, an, that's a hell of a uh, no-defense platoon. Two, zero stolen base upside. Yeah. How is a guy that young that slow? I just He's, he's not never, like a big, he's ne- he's bulky never guy. Base, he's never stolen a base in the minor, in the majors. Yeah, he, Ever. I I just don't get why he's like so, such a zero when it comes to stolen bases. But even the minors, his career high is four uh, in 108 games, so he's he's not going to run. And you know, it, you know, sometimes you know, a guy can, yeah, you know, you're like, okay, he's not going to help me there. But a zero, I mean, he's got to be able to hit 30 homers to be able to justify that, or hit for a high average. 20th percentile sprint speed. He's actually really really slow. Yeah, I, I don't get that. Uh, and so if he doesn't hit for average and he doesn't run, I mean, he really got a rake to be able to, you know, you got to hit for some power. I mean, and, and, and not, even in his good year in Texas uh, in 2019, which he was very good, 847 OPS, he still hit 269. That's good, but it's not helping you with batting average. It's just not hurting you. i take I take that in a second, though. Yeah, I, I maybe. I, I mean, yeah, he did hit 21 homers in 83 games. That could be a, you know, in a full season, we yeah. can we can dream on that. Yeah, we can. Yeah. So the 30 home run, I mean, he's thrown, he's shown, shown some home run upside. I like that he doesn't strike out. I like to hit the ball hard. I just think in in, you're, in the 20s, you're looking for someone who has some upside. But if you need to use him, like, I don't think he hurts you. I think he's going to hit for some power. Like, you're right, there's no speed there. But you're talking a, a seventh outfielder. I think that there's enough upside there that uh, he works pretty well as a seventh mm-hmm. outfielder. I, I will ask, do, do the Rangers like him? That's a really good question. I'm not sure the answer to that, to be honest with you. Because, I mean, we may see something. We may see all this upside. Why are the Rangers such idiots? Why are they doing But the fact is, if they don't like him, they don't like him. So, I mean, they maybe they do. Maybe they like him just fine, and it's all been happenstance. I just remember 2019, he got called up and then, like, mysteriously got sent down because they, the numbers game and all that after he was raking. It's just like... And he was pissed about it too. Yeah, and you know, and he had had attitude problems in the past when he first joined the Rangers. I think all all that kind of came in, but maybe this, you know, maybe he, he's worn. You know, he, his act is old, or maybe he's growing up now, and it doesn't matter. But I think that stuff, all that stuff, matters, yeah. even though we think it doesn't. And I think Chris Davis, if he sticks, hurts him more than anybody. Because you, you mentioned the lack of defense. Uh, you look at his game log last year, and he was almost played. You mentioned the eight games now, but every other game was a DH. You know, in terms of liking him, he did hit second and third in a bunch of games. So I mean, that's uh, it's enough that uh, maybe they do like him a little. But you're right. I think the DH stuff is a little concerning. There. That that is a uh, the Davis stuff does concern me a little more now that I look at it closer. Yeah, his defense was so good they played Shin Shu Chu in the outfield. Uh, I still think he's Omar Vizquel compared to Chris Davis in the outfield. True that. Chris Davis is horrible out there. Yeah. yeah there's, a, there's a lot of people like that out there. The Reds start two of them in their corner. So. And, I don't, because we haven't I don't, had enough Reds talk, so I thought I'd I don't that say this there. often. We, I joke around about it. I don't say it often. I'm pretty sure I can throw harder than Chris Davis. Yeah. Yeah, you got more range than Jeff McNeil and throw harder than Chris Davis. The Jeff McNeil's kind of joking around. I'm actually pretty serious about Chris Davis. Yeah. 
he can't throw the ball from left field to second. Like it's it's really tough to get it all the way there. That that's problematic. It is. Yeah. Um. So let's talk, let's talk about another outfielder. Another outfielder that was really good in 2019. Kind of segues from uh, Willie Calhoun. Oscar Mercado uh, was 15, 15, hit 270 and 219. His ADP was 114 last year. So like an eighth round pick. Uh, he hit 128 with one home run, Jeff, in 93 plate appearances. He was absolutely horrible. Did have a 169 BABIP. Uh, you got to think that that bounced back a little bit. If you look at Mercado, though, the, the upside you see here, I think the concern is probably playing time. He probably is a starting center fielder now, but down the order in a short bench. But you look at him in the minors. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, 50 stolen bases, 33, 38, 37. Those are massive numbers. He's a guy that mm-hmm. can really steal bases. He's fast. Um how, what the heck do you do with someone like this? Uh, I, I don't. You got to factor in 2020 a little bit, but obviously it's a weird season. He had 100 play, had 93 plate appearances. Um, what do you do with Mercado? ADP is 270 spots, 280 spots lower than last year. I mean, he got dropped in the batting order before the season started. Remember, people yeah, were projecting him that. as a leadoff yeah. hitter, uh, and all of a sudden he's batting eighth and ninth yep, on opening day, yeah. uh, and. It's like he got, they could see in the, the training camp that he was overmatched, I, I think. And you, you go back, take a look at his minor league numbers real close. Yeah, this, the stolen bases are nice, but 2019 sticks out like a sore thumb. Is his one year where he really hit. Yeah, and the concern for me as you look at it, it's like a lot of ugly batting average years in the minors too. Like there's some, there's some, there's like a, a 224 in there, a 215. There's some, there's a couple 280s, but like usually guys that, you want to steal some bases and hit. You hope for some good average in the minors. And maybe, you know, it they, it goes down a little bit in the majors. But I, the batting average just is kind of real with him. And you look at the ISOs. There's a lot of zeros to start there. That's it's, that's never it's good. Not good. The, uh, 15, the 15 home runs in the majors are pretty surprising when you kind of look at the rest of his profile. Yeah. I I, I just I'm not convinced he can hit. Uh, so that that's kind of limiting in terms of your investing. Stol- I mean, stolen, lack of com- base, stolen base upside at that price, though, is hard to find. Sure, sure. I mean, again, it's the price, uh, but you know, in th- that that's it's kind of not a great thing when your biggest a- your biggest uh, selling point is for the price. You know, you yeah. want actually, you know, you got you want to be able to produce, but uh, you know, obviously, but that's the whole thing. You're not going to find guys at that level that are, are right. sure that's things. Thing. That, that's the whole thing. So, yeah, I could see the upside. Yeah. I could also see Bradley Zimmer starting ahead of him. You know, yeah, that's the thing. Is like, well, how do you how do you think he is looking in terms of Obviously, spring training will probably matter a little bit for him, how he looks. I think if he looks overmatched in spring, that'll matter. It's one of those guys where spring training stats might actually uh, be important. Um, what, do you, what, how do you think they, they walk into – do you think he's playing center field opening day? Do you think it's Bradley Zimmer? Do you think it's someone else totally? Could um, be a platoon. Yeah. And he could maybe – I guess Jordan Luplo's there to, to mash some lefties too. It's just they don't have – they only have one outfielder, right? They only have Rosario that's really an outfielder. At Rosario the like and then start. wherever you play Naylor. Yeah, I had Naylor at first base. I do too. But first base, but let's, your boy Jake Bowers is jumping in there. Bowers, uh, I think he's out of options. Uh, yeah. And then Bobby Bradley, you know, it's the island of lost soul first baseman there. And, uh, you know, between Naylor, Bowers, and Bradley, I think they'd like to have two of those guys work out, theoretically. Fran Mill Reyes, they really would not, really would rather him not play the field at all. For sure. Uh, so that, that kind of takes away one spot. But, I mean, right now on our depth chart, Daniel Johnson's the starting right fielder. And maybe he's better than I'm giving him credit for. I mean, it's just a you know, name I don't, I'm not totally familiar with. But that, that the whole point is they're not locked in on anything. Daniel Johnson's got better minor league numbers than Mercado, by the way, as a hitter at least. Definitely batting average-wise, a little more pop it looks like, yeah. But has played, what, 84 games above double-A? Right. Um, obviously had a short stint with the Indians last year. But I, it's, it's weird. Like, they just... For a team that has, you know, you got Cesar Hernandez, Jose Ramirez, Rosario, Reyes, Naylor, like the top five that you are pretty sure are going to start. Um, the, and then whoever plays catcher, I guess Roberto Perez and a little Austin Hedges in there. Um, the bottom three of the order is pretty wide open, depending on what they do with with Jimenez and Ahmad Rosario. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I'll say this, too, about the Indians. I mean, they have prospects uh, that you got to watch out for. Uh, with You know, they lost year. We don't know when where George Valera is going to start out at. Nolan Jones, or some talk he could be third base, some talk he could be an outfielder. Um, originally, I think he came up as an outfielder. Uh, so we'll see where, where they use him. But if Nolan Jones goes to the outfield, that changes things a little bit. Nolan Jones is a really good prospect, and he was in double A in 2019. So he could come quick. 
of course, it's the Indians. Service time manipulation is always a factor here as well, uh, but something to watch for. Do you think we end up seeing Jimenez or Rosario in the outfield a bunch? I think we don't. No, not Jimenez. I think you'll see Rosario out there. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, they might play service time games with Jimenez, which would be stupid because he's ready yeah, now. I read, that. I saw some, I saw some rumors of that too, and just to buy another year, and then let Rosario play shortstop when he comes up. But they've got a lot of uh, that bottom half of the order. There could be some interesting parts that uh, we're not going to know what how they're going to end up with, but maybe maybe we'll look good and as as they get they kind of solidify themselves. But it's a pretty open competition there. It is, and Rosario could be traded to the Reds too. I've heard that rumor. Uh, a lot of different ways that this could go for the I Indians. wouldn't I wouldn't hate that if uh, if I were a Reds fan. I think that'd be all right. It'd be better than the R in the long run, I think. I think so too. Um so let's jump down to some, another outfielder that has uh, been buzzy in the past that uh is kind of interesting is Franchi Cordero. I know a lot of the uh the Rotowire guys uh, like have liked him a lot over the past couple of years. I remember we did some mock drafts where um when he gets taken everybody uh, everybody's upset. I think the hype is finally off. I think he had some hype for a couple of years. I think it's finally off. But, you know, he's he got traded to Kansas City. He should play regularly. Um, has a pretty good chance to play uh, at least most days there. He's one of those guys that strikes out a ton but hits the ball hard. If you squint a little bit, you can kind of see some poor man Teoscar in this profile. He's fast. He has a 70% sprint speed guy. He was uh, he was he was even higher in 27, 2018. So fast, still 26, hits the ball really hard, strikes out a ton. It's kind of what we saw with Teosco last year. I mean, Teosco had a little more uh, stuff we were excited about. But um, I don't know. He's an interesting profile that is obviously very risky because of the batting average uh, downside with the strikeout rate. Yeah, it's a shame he had that wrist injury last year because last year was a perfect opportunity for him to be, you know, treat the season as a laboratory, get him lots of playing time. Instead, he only got 42 plate appearances. And now they signed Michael A. Taylor. Um, you know, they also uh, have Ed Oliveris, who is, this, who is the new Cordero, by the way. You know, people love yeah. Oliveris now. Uh, love the speed potential, even though he didn't run last year. But uh, there, there's, you know, Kansas City likes to trade with San Diego, apparently. But, uh, you know, I think both those guys could be really interesting. I think I th there's room for both. And I, I think this is kind of last chance corral for uh, Cordero. It could be where he kind of fulfills his potential or he's this, this is it. I really hope that Michael A. Taylor doesn't block anybody fun. Yeah, uh, I think the Royals have gotten smarter. Uh, you look at their farm system; they got some yeah. really interesting names. Uh, I think they signed like Santana just to tide things over for a little bit. I think, you know, they spent some money in the right places. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, you look at that for the top six of that lineup; it doesn't look nearly as bad as it has in the past. And if either Franchi or Oliveras, or you know, even if Taylor's good, they could be a, they could definitely be a longer lineup than they've had in, in prior years. Yeah. Kansas City, Seattle, two teams that are probably going to be weak this year, but are dangerous in the long run. Yeah, I think like a, a 2023, 20, 24 window on both those teams is pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, I think I, if, if the Cordero price does not uh, rise as he you know looks to be a starter in Kansas City, I think I'll have a lot of him on teams that uh, if he's anywhere near it in the, in the 400s. Yeah, I think so too. What does one do with uh, with Carlos Martinez? Uh, ADP is 423, but I think that's going to move a lot based on role. Um, he said he feels 100%. He's pitching in the uh, Dominican Winter League. Uh, the GM of the uh, of the Cardinals, Mosaliak, said he has to come in and earn his spot. So he's not uh, not a guy that has a spot locked up. But you talk about someone whose like range of outcomes could be anything. Like he could end up in long relief. He could end up being a really good starter. He was horrible last year in 2020, <laughs> but only five starts. I mean, he had a 10 ERA. Um, he didn't strike anybody out, but if you look at 2019, he had 3.17 area. A lot of those were as a reliever, but he jumped out to 2018, 3.11 area in 118 innings. Um, his ERA has been 3.7 or under for five years in a row prior to 2020. There's a guy that like put up really good stats for, for many years. K rates usually about a 21 to 25%. So he's not a huge K guy, but decent enough. Walk rates usually maybe a little higher than you want, but a decent range, about 8%. Yeah, um, he's been a guy that avoids hard contact under 34 uh, percent the five years prior. I'm throwing out 2020 and all this under five percent barrel rate in each of those years, too. So, like in the 400, he's an arm that you could see really helping you. And if it you know, if it's not there, if it's 2020, you just kind of dump him. I think he's a guy we're taking a shot on here. I think you're right. To be clear, I don't like Carlos Martinez um, as a human or as a fantasy player. Yes. Uh, okay. No, I don't know him as a human. Uh, I know there is that incident in winter ball where i guess they thought he got arrested for uh violating covid protocols but then it wasn't and i'm not really sure how to handicap that i don't like how we don't know what his role is every single year 
yeah. that gets annoying. Uh, last year has to be looked at as a one-off. Uh, that can you compare that versus other years? I mean, the, the interrupted season, yeah, and the oblique innings. injury, all that. That said, I just, eh, I kind of, I mean, he's one of those guys that's inconvenient. I want other people to win the jobs. I want like Ponce de Leon to get a full shot, for instance. But that's not how the way of the universe works. You know, I, you know how I want it isn't how how it happens. So instead of just hand waving it away, I probably need to look at it a little closer. My my instinct so far has been to, to say let somebody else take him. But when I get push comes to shove in the main, by then we'll have a better idea if he's got a starting job. Yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, I, I'm I'm not being put to the test on that now. I've got the, the mixed labor draft in two, a week actually, a week and a day. Okay. That's a 15 teamer. So, all right. 28th round, 27th round, sure. I'll, I'll... Yeah, I just, I just think with pitchers down there, so many of them are so bad. He's someone that uh, you could see. Like, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's crazy to think he has like a 3.9 ERA, and that really helps at that price. In a 15 team league, if you're going 30 rounds, you're probably cutting seven, at least seven, maybe more of your bottom 10 picks. So, I, yeah, I, I would say maybe maybe more. I mean, and it's he's just someone that I think can uh, you can see that there's it's been he's been good in the past. He could help you, and I think you'll know pretty quick if he can't. Yeah. So point is, yeah, if you see an upside there, take it. You know, I, do I, you uh, do you see any upside in in Garrett Richards at all? Kind of in that same range after he signed with the Red Sox. I wish he would have signed elsewhere. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I, AL East is tough. He hasn't topped 100 innings since 2015. I just kind of find it hard to, to jump in on that. Like I would take Carlos Martinez over him for sure, and they're kind of in that same range. Ballpark doesn't isn't good. Um, no, I I I think I, I think I agree with you on that. He throws hard. He throws he throws no ninety five last year, so the velocity was still there. But yeah, I just don't. Uh, he had that he had that one year in twenty eighteen where his K rate was elevated, but still seventy six. I mean, I just you're gonna get, seeing a lot of innings out of him. Like even the hundred twenty innings is hard to it's hard to see with Richards right now. Yeah, I agree. What about uh, Joey Devil guy that we liked a couple years ago? Um, sticking in Cleveland, uh, they, they usually do really well with pitchers. Cal Quantrill is kind of an interesting name. He's going to be fighting for the the number five job with Logan Allen. It sounds like uh, their, their top four is pretty set with uh, with the guys they have there. Um, you know, with Carrasco being traded, obviously there's a, there's an opening. It's, you know, there's not a lot of good stats with Quantrill. Uh, he was a he was 2019. He pitched 103 innings with 5.16 ERA. Um, did up his strikeout rate last year, 23 percent. Throws hard. Throws 95. He's avoided hard contact well in his two years in the majors, 32%. Um, 91st percentile exit velocity guy last year. Um, gets a decent number of ground balls at 44%. I just, I don't know. He seems like there's enough there that maybe they could they could mold something in him. And Indians just do really well figuring out how to how to get starting pitchers to kind of their peak performance. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, you, I, you have to, when you look at his ADP, I think you should do it after the trade because after yeah. that was when Carrasco was gone. Uh, so let's just say like the 11th, that gives us that's a few days of buffer after the trade. Cause I think the trade happened on the seventh. Uh, so if you look at his ADP from that point on where, you know, he's got a better chance at his job, it's still pretty high. I mean, it's still 450 or so, uh, yeah. you know, pick player number 396. So yet I kind of like him. I had Bernie Plaskoff on the show on Sirius XM last week and he likes him a little bit. Oh, nice. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, I, I think that, endurance is an issue i think he's one of those second and third time through the order guys i need to like actually back that up with facts but that's my perception from 2019 is he'd be going along okay i i do remember some of those starts yes i i, I rostered those starts and i think you probably did too I now, did. a couple of those were against the dodgers though too that's another one of those things so we might be like fooling ourselves just a little bit too uh pulling up his 2019 stats but uh let's see through the order Third time through the order. Ooh, 1166 ERA. Yes, hello. Well, of course, it's 470 second up. time. But, yeah, it, yeah, it, this was as a starting pitcher, too. So And, and he was know. going along He was going along well that year, and then he had those three starts in a row. He had eight runs. Like, it was just a disaster at oh, that point. I mean, yeah. And he was he was actually rolling along pretty well. I think you and I both had the the first eight one, and then we got out of it after that. I don't think I took the second one on, but I definitely had the first one. Um, he just I might have had them all. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, that was the league I lost to Dan, uh, Dan Preppis. Uh, I don't like. I think I might have had him going. I was just trying to max out starts or something stupid like that. He had he had this really good run where it was like it was. I'm looking at it right now. It's like look, it was like eight starts in a row where you get three runs or fewer, 
and then 888. So I don't know what happened there, but it definitely skews his overall numbers. You get 24 runs and three starts, it's going to happen. But I don't know. I find him, I mean, at, at late in a draft, I think that he's a guy that uh, I'm a lot more interested in than almost all the names I see down, down way low. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, I, I mean, it's easy to appeal. This is another organizational appeal to authority. Pitcher yep. magic that they have here. One more name I want to ask you about before we get out of here. We've gone a little bit long as usual. Um, Colin Moran in Pittsburgh um, should hit third and play every day, conceivably. They don't have a lot there. Mm-hmm. His ADP is about 450 also. He's one someone that you look at 2020 and you kind of have to factor in how much it matters. But hard hit rate went from 34% to 47%. Huge jump up there. Yeah. Barrel rate went from 6.5% from, to 13.5%. Like, Dude hit the ball really hard last year, and I didn't really know that until I looked a little deeper into him. The K rate went up also. Maybe he was, like, selling out a little bit. But, you know, if you're going to sell a little bit, that's probably going to help us at this price. Ten home runs in 52 games. Um, he's going to hit third. The lineup's going to be horrible, but he's going to play every day. Uh, I'm kind of buying in on and seeing if the hard hit rates are, are legit, maybe, and see what we're looking at after six weeks or so, and then, you know, decide whether to dump him or not. But he's someone that I think you can get late that is mildly interesting. Yeah, and yeah, like you said, it's hard to find guys that play every day at that price, let alone have some power upside. He's good enough to play every day, but not so good enough that the Pirates don't want to trade him yet. Exactly um, right. And yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, sure. Contact rate was seventy-one percent last year. That's a you know, it's gone from ninety to eighty to seventy-four point nine to seventy point eight. So there, there is a trend there. Uh, yeah, I think he's I think he's changing who he is as a hitter, and you see you're gonna see some batting average downside, but some power upside. Yeah, somehow the stench of Pittsburgh uh, he was able to wash off of him and have a decent enough season last year when yeah. so many Pirates hitters just tanked. You yeah. know, seeing Brian Reynolds have the season he did last year was just amazing yeah. to me. And Josh uh, Bell, I mean Josh Bell was really bad too. Yeah, and, and their middle infielders were bad. I mean, he, Kevin Newman was bad too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just yeah, and then Brian Hayes comes up. Hey guys. Oh, hey, don't touch him. <laughs> I'm gonna, don't touch I'm gonna, him. I'm going to hit 430 for a while. You guys don't mind me. No touching. Leave him alone. Uh, yeah. I, what do you think? Where are you on Hayes, by the way? I know this does not fit our 300 plus thing, but. No, I mean, he's, what's his, his ADP is probably going to be in the 200s, I assume. A little higher, maybe. Yeah. I mean, his, his numbers were so off the chart. He, he was one, it's 143 right now. Oh, wow. He's higher, even higher than I thought. Um. He's a guy that was really good in the minors and steals some bases too, which is interesting. He had 27 steals in 2017 in high A, and then you know had, a, had the double A season in triple A. He was 10 and 12. Yeah, I think that price is a little too high for me, especially in Pittsburgh. But me too. you look, he hit the ball really hard. He's like a 55 percent hard hit last year in his his limited time when he after he got called up. It's weird they took so long to call him up. Maybe it was a the service time stuff was weird last year. I don't even know how it even really counted, but. Um, yeah, I think that I think that uh, a lot of it looks real, but I think the price in the tenth round, I think there's other guys there that I'm probably clicking on pretty quick over him. Yeah, and the whole thing about Hayes was in the minors, he's supposed to be great glove. Don't know if the power is going to come, and of course he tears it up upon getting called up. I almost think he's he's a pretty good candidate for regression. I probably don't think I'll draft him that often, especially because there's so many other good third basemen, and the I team context that, is just so crappy. Yeah. Uh, between that and the price i just uh, i'm probably out although i think he's an intriguing guy but i'm, I'm a little surprised the price is that high yeah uh, I, I think so too i mean i like the player i hope he does well i just don't think i'm gonna be be in it on that price that's uh that lineup is rough yeah and is. they're trying to trade adam frazier apparently too so it might get even a little rougher what are they going to get for adam frazier i don't know there were some just some rumors that he was going to be moved uh he'd probably start for the a's right now or the reds here we, here. What what are we doing? It's our teams are just a mess right now. Oh, oh well, yeah, and, and in fact, the and the, 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 the Pirates' left. depth at shortstop has been mentioned as a potential solution for the Reds. Eric Gonzalez could be a great fit for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah, I think I think Adam Frazier's better than Tony Kemp, to be honest. So yeah, maybe. Yeah, and Frazier's not even a shortstop, but we're looking at like Gonzalez, Newman, Tucker. They got three guys that could stand at shortstop that would be better than what the Reds have. That uh, that Cole Tucker uh, sheen sure worn off pretty quickly, didn't it? Yeah, I mean he's an outfielder now. He was gonna he I mean he was huge that one that fab time he got called up everybody was jumping on him he had the the thirty five stolen bases in twenty eighteen and everybody wanted the stolen bases he was uh he was not good in twenty nineteen or twenty twenty. Yeah, I, I'm starting to notice a trend with some of the uh, Fab Palooza guys the huge stolen base guys are yep. not so huge. 
Yeah, there was a. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of big prices that didn't work out. But you look at that 2019 when he got called up and was popular. Zero stolen bases in 159 plate appearances and two home runs, and he hit 211. I remember like I think, he, I think he played a couple games too before we bid on him, and he had that like double, like the hustle double where he shook out his hair and everybody was fired up, and then it was just. Not- <laughs> Is Lopezian? It was very Nicky Lopezian. Oh god, that was uh, that was not good either. Yeah, two homers, we, one stolen base, and four hundred and two plate appearances. We were sure Nicky Lopez was going to come up and hit three twenty and steal a bunch of bases. Uh, uh, Two ninety at least, minimum floor. <laughs> Anybody else that uh, you want to talk about before we get out of here for the night? No, let's get out of here. Beautiful. Well, thanks everybody for listening to the Roadwire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. As always, really appreciate that. You want to follow Jeff on Twitter? He's at Jeff underscore Erickson. I am at Scott Jenstead. Other than that, uh, we haven't figured out a topic for uh, next week yet, so uh, we'll we'll tweet that out to maybe take some uh, suggestions. But other than that, hope everybody has a great week. We'll be back back at you next Sunday. Take care. Please like our video and subscribe to RotoWire. Then go to RotoWire.com slash pod for a free 10-day trial.